please stand for today's scripture reading, which is taken from 1 John chapter 3, verse 16 to 24. You may follow along with me by turning to page 240 in the New Testament section of the Pew Bible. We know love by this, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for one another. How does God's love abide in anyone who has the world's goods and sees a brother or sister in need and yet refuses help? Little children, let us love, not in word or speech, but in truth and action. And by this, we will know that we are from the truth and we will reassure our hearts before him whenever our hearts condemn us. For God is greater than our hearts and he knows everything. Beloved, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have boldness before God and we receive from him whatever we ask because we obey his commandments and do what pleases him. And this is his commandment, that we should believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another, just as he has commanded us. All who obey his commandments abide in him, and he abides in them. And by this we know that he is, abides in us, by the spirit that he has given us. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Hey, Chapelwood family, welcome to worship today at Chapelwood. We always encourage you to visit chapelwood.org slash home. There you can find all sorts of information about submitting prayer requests, but we ask you to register your attendance. Also, if there's anything that we can do to be in ministry with you, let us know. We're so glad that you're here as we experience this wonderful worship service together. And we want you to know that even though you're with us online, you are a part of this family. You belong here. Welcome home to Chapelwood. So glad to be with you this morning. Uh, for those in the sanctuary and those online, uh, I'm just uh, happy to be here. I've really enjoyed being in First John for this series. Uh, last week, I had the chance to be at Fairhaven, and one of the things that really sticks out to this book, to about this book to me is that it's about a generation handing off wisdom to another generation. That it's, it's this group of people who walked with Jesus, taking what it means to be a Christ follower and translating it to the next generation so that they continue to live in faith. So they continue to be marked by Christ and, the, by Christ and this um, knowledge that they have doesn't diminish and go away. Uh, I shared last week at Fairhaven that um, what it is to be a child of God, uh, what it means to be marked in that way is to be holy, to be set apart. And this morning we're going to continue to talk about what are those traits that, that come with being part of a family. What are the things that we carry with us that are seen and unseen? And specifically today we're going to talk about what it means to know Christ as truth. And then what is our response after we've encountered Christ and the way that he loves uh, and the encouragement that we maybe can love the same way? Will you all pray with me as we uh, start? God, I pray uh, for our time together. Uh, I thank you for the worship that we have already experienced. And I pray, Spirit, that you would continue to move. Lord, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart would be pleasing to you that what we hear today would be from you uh, and that I would be put aside. It's in your name I pray, amen. Just before these verses that we heard earlier, uh, in the scripture, it talks about Cain and Abel. And so if you know the story of Cain and Abel, they are sons of Adam and Eve from the very beginning in Genesis of the Old Testament. Uh, and Cain and Abel, Abel had a sibling rivalry that maybe went too far. Um, Abel was favored by God, the offerings that he brought uh, before God, and Cain was jealous of that. Um, and so he, he killed his brother um, and uh, made himself prominent. And what's super interesting to me in this story is that God comes and asks Cain, where is Abel? And his response uh, is simply, am I my brother's keeper? Which 
isn't technically saying I didn't do it or that I did something wrong, uh, but, but something is going on there, right? And it's interesting that this passage is used uh, because it's so starkly different from the rest of our passage. It's what the author is trying to do, to set up this comparison from the beginning, to say, hey, this, this Cain and Abel situation, don't be like them. This is not the answer. This is not what it means uh, to be Christian. And some of us would maybe just say like basic humanity. That's not really the route to go, right? And then we enter into this passage of what it is that we're called to. That we're called to lay down our lives for one another. That our words and actions, our thoughts and our deeds have to be in alignment with one another. That we are called to love, and by this, we will know that we are rooted in the truth, in the truth of Christ. Our hearts will be assured when we are before God, because we will know that we are rooted in Christ. And then towards the end, that we will feel free, that we will have a boldness in the way that we are living our lives, because the Spirit will be guiding us. We'll know we're headed the right direction because the spirit will be affirming that everything is in alignment with one another. One of the verses that stands out to me um, is, dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. I was thinking about that verse this week and specifically this word truth. And what does that mean? And what does that mean in this passage? And as I kind of wrestled with it, here in 1 John, what truth means is an experiential truth. It's something that we know to be true because we have experienced it firsthand. We have lived it out. You know something from the inside. It gives you a special kind of uh, inner authority because you know that that thing is real. Uh, I had a youth pastor growing up, uh, and he used to say um, that there are certain things that you know that you know that you know. They're rooted in you. They're in your gut. You know that they're real and that they're truth. There aren't a lot of things that I know uh, with that level of conviction. Uh, One of them is that I love sour candy. Uh, growing up, I would eat sour candy until I got sick, like, right, like the sores, like it was, it was not great. Uh, but I would always return to it. <laughs> I know that I love sour candy. I know which cry my two-year-old has that signifies that something is very wrong. I know that cry because I can describe to you experiences where I have heard that cry. I know um, what it is for him to be in that kind of pain because I heard it when he almost bit through his tongue on the playground. Not all the way through, the ho- so the hospital can't help you, just a fun fact for you, uh, but a lot of the way through his tongue. There was a lot of blood. I know that cry because of when he touched something that was too hot and his hand began to blister. I know that cry. And you haven't experienced that cry, but trust me when I tell you from my experience, I know what that cry sounds like. And I know that I know that I know that I am a loved child of God, that the spirit is is at work within me. And I know that because I can describe to you when that became truth for me. I can tell you about the night on a retreat when I heard and experienced the love of God in a way that transformed my life, that marked my life, that changed the way that I would live. I know that I know that I know those things. They're anchored within me. In John 3, that's the kind of truth he's talking about. What experiential truth do you have in your interactions with Christ that mark you and change the way you are living? We know this truth because we have experienced personally what love is. We know ourselves as a people of truth because we have experienced in our own being the truth of Christ for ourselves. We know God's abiding presence within us because we have had personal experience with the Spirit. The truth 
that our actions are rooted in is the embodiment of, God, of love that we have seen in the way Jesus lived and loves us. If you simply look at uh, the Gospels, the story of Jesus' life, you see love lived out in a radically different way than what the culture would say we should be acting and behaving. One of my favorite stories in the Gospels is the feeding of the 5,000. Um, and it's not so much the miracle of the 5,000 that intrigues me, but what happens right before that story Right before that, Jesus has found out that his cousin John the Baptist, um, the, his cousin whom he loves and has shared life with, has been killed. Jesus is in the midst of grief. Scripture tells us that. He's mourning, and so he seeks to get away, and he gets on a boat, and they travel across the lake to the other side. And when he gets to the other side, all of these people have gathered. And when Jesus gets off that boat, even though he's in the midst of his own grief, he sees with eyes of compassion. He sees people that are in need of healing. He sees people that need to encounter something different in their lives, that need to hear truth. And so he teaches and he heals. And towards the end of the night, when the disciples would say, we can send them home and they can find food, Jesus says, no, we can feed them. They're hungry. And he breaks bread and he prays over the fish and the disciples take that meal and it's multiplied for the masses. And then Jesus goes away and spends time alone processing his grief grieving his cousin. Another story that stands out in the Gospels, when I think about loving in a radical way, is the story of the Samaritan woman. This woman who is so ostracized from her community, who is cast aside, that, that when she decides to go get the water that she needs for survival, instead of traveling down in the early hours or the late hours with everyone else, when it's cooler in the day, she goes at high noon, the hottest time of day to carry her vessels of water home so that she doesn't have to make eye contact or look at anybody from the community so that she can avoid uh, being shunned in that time. And Jesus, a male, stops to talk to her. Jesus, a Jewish male, stops to talk to a Samaritan woman who by all accounts he should have nothing to do with according to the culture. When he talks with her, he treats her in a way that signifies that she has dignity, that she has worth, which is not anything she has encountered from the community that she lives in. And she's transformed by that interaction. Jesus' love is experienced for her in such a way that it changes everything about how she defines who she is. Scripture says that she runs back to the village, to these people that she's avoiding, remember, and starts to speak truth to them about the Christ and the Messiah and brings them back so that they might talk to him. We can look at Holy Week and the way that Jesus, in the midst of knowing a betrayal is coming, know that he is heading to his death on a cross, stops to wash his disciples' feet, to encourage them to continue to love in this kind of radical way, so that even when they are encountered by swords and violence, he is continuing to say, no, we're set apart, we're different. This is not how we're gonna do things. He heads to a cross, he's tortured, he's hung. He has the most um, humiliating death of that time in a very public display. And then raises from the dead. This radical example of love that is not just a laying down of his life at the end on a cross, but is something that you can see through his whole life, through the way that Jesus shows up in every interaction, in a way that sees people. All of his life was to show what it is to love others, to come alongside 
for us to see that followers of Jesus are people who lay down our lives, not just at the end, but in all of the moments in between. Jesus was the pioneer who went before us and showed us a countercultural way of being in the world. To be a Christ follower is to love and live the way Jesus lived. To lay down ourselves, our desires, our plans, our schedules, our to-do lists, our busyness, to lay it down just as Jesus did. Jesus' pattern of self-giving is to be our pattern for living. Jesus lived out love and it transformed everything he did and everyone that he interacted with. When we encounter that kind of truth, that kind of love, our response to seeing the way that he loves others, to see that truth is what it is to be Christ-like and be transformed by it. First John is pointing to a deeper softening of the Christ follower's heart, a tenderizing of our heart that is able to feel compassion for those who have their backs against the wall. The aim of Christian discipleship is a transformed inner life, a life that embodies Christ in the world, a life that sees with eyes of compassion and mercy. And out of that transformation, we see that love acts. Love does. I said a minute ago that Christian discipleship is about this transformation of an inner life. But it can't stay there. It has to move outward. It has to to change uh, the people around us, the world around us, to change the way we interact and live. 1 John 3, 18 from the message says it this way. Let's not just talk about love. Let's practice real love. This is the only way we'll know that we are living truly. Love is action that embodies truth, that is anchored in the truth of Christ. Reduced to a bare minimum, this letter says that to be Christian is to focus on two things, faith and love. Loving actions are the stuff of everyday life. It shows up um, by bringing a meal to someone's house, by texting someone, letting them know that you were thinking about them, by praying for someone when their name comes to mind. It's an encouraging word. It's the last minute phone call for someone to join you for a meal. It's sitting in the hospital with a friend who has a loved one in surgery or in treatment. Someone I know who has lived this out uh, without even having to think about it. It's like breathing is my mom. For as long as I can remember, she's somebody who shows up for people in radical ways. It doesn't matter what she has going on. If she knows of a need that someone has, she's going to be there. She's going she's gonna to drop off the meal. She's going to find out a way that she can help. And even if she can't help at the root of the problem with whatever it is that's going on, she's going to make sure that that person feels known and seen and loved. She's going to do what she can. It showed up in college with my friends, right? Uh, if she found out that there was something going on, she was going to do whatever she could to help. It meant that when she came up for weekends, uh, she was making all of their favorite meals, right, to get a little bit of home. Even if that meant that we were having chips and queso with cheesy chicken spaghetti followed by a cheesecake, which is maybe too much dairy for a meal, but she was going to make sure they had their favorites and whatever it is that they need. Even still today, if she knew of something that was going on with my friends, she would try to show up for them to make sure they felt cared for. As I got married, the same is true for for my husband's friends and family. If she knows of a need, she's going to be there for them. And my hunch is if she knew that you had a need, she would show up for you in some way as well. So just in case, her phone number is 713. Just kidding. Just kidding. I won't give it out. It's okay. It's fine. But you can find her in the donut hallway most Sundays, so just let her know. For her, it's like breathing. Breathing. She doesn't have to think about it. It's just how she reacts and responds to the world. For some of us, it's not so easy. It takes practice. It's like honing any other skill in our life or we would in work. 
It's learning to see with different eyes so that we can respond, so that we can come alongside, so that we can love people. If you were to consciously practice Jesus-like love this week for a particular brother or sister, what would it look like? What would it look like in your family, in your work environment, in your community? What would it look like for the people that you struggle with and don't always get along with? At the beginning, I shared uh, that before this section of verses is the story of Cain and Abel. That story is like the bare minimum, right? (laughs) We are called to something more. Christ followers show up with more than that in the world. It's not about simply not killing. (laughs) It's about making others see uh, that they are worth something, that they have value that they are loved and known. We have a mandate to love others, to come alongside. It isn't just pick and choose one thing. It might be uh, that for you it means serving at the food pantry and picking up the phone to check in on someone. It might mean bringing a meal um, and serving to help someone have a safe and secure home with the restoration team. It might mean volunteering with VBS, even if little kids kind of weird you out uh, and you don't know how to love them because they have all of the energy, right? It might mean visiting someone in the hospital, even if it's way outside your comfort zone and learning that there's something um, of value for you that's transformative when you do something outside of your comfort zone as well as transformative for them. When you stretch and do something, you might find that that uncomfortable space is sacred space where the spirit shows up in a mighty way. And it might mean that you do all of those things and more throughout different seasons of your life. We are called to see the people in the world around us with compassion and mercy and then do something about what we see. Towards the end of the passage, uh, we're reassured that we know truth and that we know that Christ is with us. And that's because the spirit is at work within us. The spirit reassures us, gives us, spirit, uh, gives us the ability to live boldly, to love boldly in this world around us. The spirit is the one that does this gentle whisper of names of people that we might need to reach out to a gentle whisper of when to speak or when not to speak, a gentle whisper of if we should go this direction or that or perhaps stay right where we are. The Spirit guides us to help align our actions and our words, to truly help us to live like Christ in our world, to embody love. And can I confess something for just a second? Sometimes it's really hard for me to hear that gentle, soft whisper. It seems like the world around us is yelling and is loud and chaotic. And if I don't make intentional time to start to get to know that gentle whisper, I miss it in the moments of chaos. I have to make time to know it so that I can recognize it. So when I'm being prompted I can say yes. So that I uh, can listen to the one that's guiding me in love, to the voice that is rooted in the truth. I shared about the story of Cain and Abel, and right now I'm um, doing this devotional that's based on the first five books of the Old Testament, the Pentateuch. And it's written by um, Rabbi Jonathan Sachs. And this is what he shares about the Cain and Abel story. He says, Cain does not deny personal responsibility in this story. When God asks him, where is Abel? Cain's response is not, I didn't do it. Instead, he denies moral responsibility. He says, am I my brother's keeper? In effect, Cain asks why he should be concerned with the welfare of anyone but himself. Why should we not do what we want if we have the power to do it? 
God absolutely gives us freedom, but he does not give us freedom from responsibility. God teaches us what we ought to do, but he does not do it for us. He works through us. It's God's voice that tells us that we can resist evil around us. We can say no to the loud voice, that we can say yes to the spirit. The great question, the question that the life we lead answers is this. Which voice will we listen to? Will we listen to the voice of anger or will we follow the voice of God, the voice of love, calling on us to make this a more just and gracious world? Friends, I think this is the heart of the passage. Do we know Jesus in such a way that we are transformed and love the people around us? Are we seeing people through eyes of mercy and compassion? Have we encountered Christ in such a way that we know that not only are we loved, but in fact others are loved as well? Are we in alignment with words that say we love and actions that show we actually do love? Are we listening to the small, still voice so that we don't miss what God is up to, so that we can take part in the transformation of the world, so that we can be witnesses, so that we can be a part of the story to the inbreaking of God's kingdom in the here and now? Will you pray with me? God, I thank you uh, for the way that you move and act the way that the Spirit guides us and reveals yourself to us. I pray that we uh, would be transformed by you in such a way that we look different from the world around us. Help us to see with eyes of compassion and mercy and then to act, to do something that conveys that people are seen and known and loved. Spirit of God, shape our hearts. Spirit of God, now guide our hands. Spirit of God, now build your kingdom among us. It's in your name I pray, amen.